creativity and scientific proficiency are often treated as if they are foreign to one another. But my guest today, Matthew Putnam, uh, seems to be proficient both in creativity and in technological sophistication. Matthew, welcome to TechCrunch TV. Thanks so much, Andrew, for having me on. So Matthew, you might introduce yourself in terms of your nanotechnology company, but also your commitment to music and creativity, and talk a little bit about what you're doing in Brooklyn. Yes, you know, I, I am the CEO and founder of a company called Nanotronics Imaging, uh, and we are a part of an organization called Pioneer Works, where, where I'm a, a a director of. Uh, so I really think of my creative life as being the intersection of the two, uh, where you can get inspiration from the arts. Uh, you can also, in sciences, be able to finally dig down and be able to quantify those things. So it's in, uh, very different than being in a normal tech space where you're surrounded by people doing similar things than, that, than you are. You teach, I know, at Columbia University. You, um, you are the author of, what, an opera, a musical? Um, and at the same time, you're doing this work in nanotechnology. How do they connect? Well, I'm not sure exactly how they connect, except for in the imagination. Uh, there is inspiration to be had in all areas. And the more myopic we get, the harder it is to be able to gain insight. I've noticed that uh, in universities, uh, every department is very insular from other departments. It's even hard for the physics department to communicate with the chemistry department, let alone with the literature department. And what department are you in at Columbia? Well, I was in the applied physics and applied mathematics. I'm, I'm no longer there yeah. as I'm full-time CEO of nanotronics imaging right now. Uh, but I spent years uh, teaching and had a research lab in nanotech, uh, looking at new materials. But there is, there has always been a strong connection between musicality and mathematics. Yeah, it's amazing how, without knowing it, we all, the, the entire department played the piano. So I went to music school, I went to a music conservatory as an undergrad, and I still play, I play free jazz now. But it seems that every scientist, especially physicists and mathematicians that I come across, plays some instrument or the other. Now, I think it's one of those subtle connections that must exist somewhere in our brains uh, that we haven't yet quantified completely, but there must be that connection. Matthew, you're based uh, on the East Coast in Brooklyn. What's going on there that makes it so exciting at the moment? Brooklyn is this incredible hotbed for really the connection of everything from the maker movement uh, to the best artists right now in the world, I think, are within a mile and a half of where I work, so the hottest artists. And there are everything from jazz clubs to rock clubs, and we all sort of assemble in one very small area. And, you know, that kind of cross-pollination keeps you from getting stuck doing what you normally do, uh, which is this intense concentration Do you on think that that cross-pollination exists in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley? You know, I don't see it as much. I certainly don't want to be judgmental about well, that. Well, you need to be judgmental if, but if you're I, on this show. Oh, OK. Well, OK, I don't think it does. <laughs> is it because I, I we're Brooklyn's all too unique. tacky out here? We're all rather barbaric? Not at all. I, I think that it's just that there's been such great success in tech here that you get caught up with the importance of what you've done rather than take a, a, a different perspective on it. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting if I go and visit a tech company that has office in New York and an office here. It, it, they could design it the exact same way, but coming from the street from New York where you're right across from a dance, uh, a dance theater and you're right next to a museum and you go in and you see the Google offices or you see these things, you see it with a different perspective. And I, I think that that really defines where we can tend to get caught up in the Bay Area with thinking that this is what, where the world is centered. Matthew, why should an, an internet audience, a startup internet audience, care about nanotechnology? Nanotechnology, this is absolutely everything from every microelectronic device you have. We'll define to it the in, in a couple of sentences. Sure. And nanotechnology has been the dream of everybody from Richard Feynman to Gordon Moore. Uh, but the idea is everything in that s scale of a billionth of a meter up to uh, a, a hundred billionth of a meter. 
So we have this scale where incredible things can happen. Things become flexible, they become conductive, they become stronger. Uh, so if you're going to have this continual shrinking of electronics, if you're going to be able to have drug delivery systems in, with um, biomedicine, you're going to need to do it on that scale. And that's been predicted forever. Nanotronics well, allows me, you to do that. Give me that. an example of what this would mean. The transformation of what a material, a, a metal is that? Well, certainly the first place it happens is in semiconductors. There's been this n nice push because of Moore's law to get smaller and more efficient. So the first place is always semiconductors and microelectronics. Uh, you have transistors which are smaller, packed into smaller areas that do more things. But also, if you do talk about composites uh, and, and metals, and I'm particularly interested in flexible things and stretchable things, so for wearables, for instance. If you want something to really be wearable or have a biosensor, those things uh, need to be done on a level that are not rigid, like a semiconductor currently is. And that's done by putting these nanoparticles into polymers and other soft materials. Is this the thing that's going to change everything? To, to, to to, to essentially reinvent the world, uh, to create something that in 20 or 30 years would be unrecognizable today? Yes, and it'll be faster than that. This is something that's been promised since the 1957 uh, talk that Richard Feynman gave, talking about these amazing qualities of nanotech. But it really is only right now that we're able to get those out of the lab and out of the imagination of theorists and get them into the world. Okay, we're in 2014 now. We're in. 2044, we use some sort of nanotech technology to, uh, to, to get us forward 30 years. Mm -hmm. What does the world look like if, if the kind of work you're doing is successful? I think the idea of quantified self becomes something that is not something we think about anymore. It's something that has direct interactions because you have biosensors that are invisible. And will they be connected to our brains? Could be, and even if they're not, the 20, by 2044 probably. Um, but in the next few years, they will be connected to another device that will have feedback and will be able to control things. So even if they are not directly connected to neurons, it's still incredibly powerful. But there is also, you can imagine that uh, preven preventative medicine becomes completely different by doing a non-invasive test every day, you will be able to prevent, uh, you, you will know months ahead of time if, there, if you're going to get cancer. We're already working towards that. That is something that nanotechnology enables. Higher resolution on, of, on things such as fMRI so we understand dementia and the way the brain works. Uh, so we get to a point where we, we actually do start having life extension. We, we have abilities to process more things because of semiconductors. It really changes everything. Peter Thiel is on your board. I know your board is very small. It's just uh, Thiel, your father, and yourself. Exactly. Um, what's it like working really closely with Peter Thiel? He has a, a reputation here as not the easiest man in the world. I've heard that, and I can't believe it. I mean, he's been incredibly supportive in every way. Uh, our meetings are not procedural meetings, they're meetings where I learn something and get direct business advice. Does he get nanotechnology? Yeah, he, he's very passionate about it. And it fits into his worldview of a, of a genuine scientific revolution, uh, changing everything, whereas the internet now seems to be very small scale. I don't, want to, I don't know about his feelings about the internet, but he does see nanotechnology as being hugely important to the long-term future, and I think we're an important nanotech investment for him. Where do you want to be with your company? Well, you know, we, we want to enable all of these things to happen. So we're not industry specific, even though we do sell to the semiconductor industry now. But we want to be enablers. So we have this phrase, to build the future, you have to see it. Uh, we, we are an imaging company. So where I see our company going is being the enabler for, uh, for all other technologies that we've talked about, from biomedicine to microelectronics to wearables to be able to do how many uh, How many people work at the company at the moment? 30 right now, but we're in the process of scaling. Uh, and where would you like to be in a couple of years? Size-wise? Yeah. Oh, I, I think in the next five years or so, we could be a, a, a fairly large company. Um, you know, I don't want to make predictions about exact how, how big the company will be in five years. Are you profitable at the moment? Big. 
I'd rather not speak about the specifics of the, the company. We are certainly in the stage where we're spending more on development and trying to create. Do the you have a product though to we sell? We do. We do, and we have we have clients and. You have a sales team. No, strangely, we don't. Uh, our our sales have come through customer pool. People are asking about this stuff, so we're going to have a sales team soon, and we'll be trying to really scale. But for right now. It's, it's very much people realize, clients realize this is something they need and are coming to us. So it's been a very nice organic growth. Now it's time to push that along a bit. Well, I hope, um, I hope uh, nanotechnology will allow us to speak again very soon. I hope so. <laughs> uh, 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 Matthew Putnam, real pleasure to have you on the show.